Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, depending on where you may be joining us from, from around the world. I'm Ariel Akbar. I'm the founder and director of the MIT Space Exploration Initiative, and it's my distinct pleasure this morning to welcome you all back to this year's installment of Beyond the Cradle. Beyond the Cradle is our annual flagship event, and this year we are bringing it to you virtually. I'd like to thank all of the members of the Zoom webinar, folks who are tuning in uh, directly with our platform today, and then also all of those of you joining on the public live stream. Now, what I'll do this morning before we transition to our keynote. Remember, so it may sound seem a bit counterintuitive that would be. Looks like we're getting a little bit of audio. Somebody uh, else, if you can have the. Um, in the midst of this pandemic, we wouldn't shut that down. And it means to increase our enrollment, which did happen last year. We did. We were. At Thank you. All right, so back to Beyond the Cradle, welcome. Uh, what I'll be doing today is giving you an overview context about what the event has in store, and then also telling you a little bit about the Space Exploration Initiative, this organization that I run behind the event and what we have been up to in the last year. So this is Beyond the Cradle. What we do every year now, this is the fifth installment, is we bring together artists and scientists, astronauts and explorers, designers and storytellers to co-convene and to co-create the future of space exploration together. And we've really loved always having um, the strong participation of the audience and a really diverse community that comes together to say, what are all of the different ways in which you want to envision the future of space exploration? It should be a future of interplanetary civilization and beyond that is reflective of the amazing tapestry of human interests um, and human skills and different disciplines on Earth. And so that is the magic of Beyond the Cradle is that we unite the creative and the technical and bring you all of this amazing content every year. And then of course this year in a new platform virtually. I wanted to say a special thank you to our amazing speakers this year. You can find the agenda for Beyond the Cradle at the link below if you manage to find us on this live stream without finding the website. This is the website. This is how you'll be able to see and follow along throughout the day. We'll be starting with a keynote from Dr. Cooper at JPL. We'll then also go into a group of lightning talks showcasing amazing research from across our broader MIT ecosystem outside of the MIT SEI, but projects that we're really proud to support. Then we'll also have an opportunity to direct you to a Moon Dialogues session, part of our collaboration uh, with the Moon Dialogues group, thinking about the future of lunar policy, uh, collaborative, active, multi-stakeholder activity on the lunar surface. We'll give you an opportunity to have a little bit of networking and meeting each other in a virtual platform that has been specially built for us by our arts curator, Shane Liu. And then we'll return in the latter part of the afternoon for our marquee life in space panel, looking at the foundational astrobiology that will help us understand whether we are alone or not alone uh, in the universe. I think it'll be a fantastic conversation. And then we'll conclude with today's event finale with the CEO of Axiom, Mike Zafardini. So we hope you'll stay tuned with us throughout the full day. We have a lot of just amazing content for you. And now I will quickly show you a little bit about the team behind all of this work uh, and our organization and my team. So we are the MIT Media Lab Space Exploration Initiative, and we like to think about the ways in which we can design, prototype, and build the artifacts of our sci-fi space future. So behind the event that we run every year is this entire R&D team uh, that's working really hard the full year round to deploy, build, test, and fly these different artifacts. And this is an artist's render from a few years ago that depicts many of the different types of projects that we work on. And I like to say if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and ESA and others are working on the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars, Moon, or beyond, we are working on the human lived experience of space. Our mission is to democratize, revolutionize, and realize space exploration. And there's a special aspect to each of these different parts. In terms of democratizing access to space, this is really our founding principle. We've been trying to think for years now about how can we make space more open access? How can we bring different disciplines that were not traditionally engaged in designing for the future of space? How can we bring them into the conversation? Uh, and of course, we also do quite a bit of STEAM outreach work to inspire the next generation to become participants in their own space future. We try to think about ways in which we can revolutionize 
space exploration. So one of the amazing freedoms of being based here at the Media Lab is this uh, provocative risk taking, the ability to work on projects that might not immediately get funded by NASA, but um, could be next generation uh, change makers for the future of technology for life in orbit. And that's some of the freedom that uh, being at MIT and being at the MIT Media Lab gives us to, to work on. And then finally, I always like to say, you're not a real space program if you're not actively launching into space. And so yes, while we do some amazing speculative work in design, our portfolio is very much focused on realizing life in space, which means deploying, testing, getting our artifacts out in a space environment. And you'll see a little bit more about how we do that in a moment. Our long-term goal, and you see that we will use this as a cheeky tagline um, occasionally on uh, different materials that we put out, is really to be growing a group, a collaborative group of institutions towards this notion of Starfleet Academy. Now, of course, Starfleet Academy is bigger than any one institution that we, that we have now, certainly bigger than we are, but this is our North Star vision to think about how could we be building an environment like this iconic concept from the Star Trek series where young minds go to prepare to explore the cosmos. Space and Starfleet Academy was where uh, the space cadets would go to be trained, the future space doctors and space lawyers and space physicians. And it was also where the fundamental technology of the Starship Enterprise was built out. And we have this amazing moment, this inflection point in the space industry, and this amazing community at MIT that we're working with and collaborating with really closely across the Institute, and this opportunity to begin the groundwork for what could be a real life Starfleet Academy. This is the team that makes it all possible. Anyone knows in the space industry, it's a massive endeavor to get anything up to orbit and to do it right. And of course, we're trying to democratize that and simplify that and, and uh, make it more and more accessible. But here is the team that's making all this amazing work happen. We're very fortunate to have some amazing leadership uh, within our MIT sphere. So we have the guidance of Dr. Maria T. Zuper, who is MIT's VP for research, and then the guidance of Dr. Joe Paradiso at the Media Lab. He's our faculty mentor within the Media Lab ecosystem. And formerly of the Aero Astro Department, of course, David Newman as our uh, Aero Astro Advisor. And we're so thrilled to be able to share with you, I'm sure many of you know by now, that Devo will be coming on as our next Media Lab Director this summer. And so we're really thrilled and very grateful for this amazing leadership team that we have. And you can see that the, you know, this is just a sampling of the broader community. The group, since you may have last uh, seen us present last year, we've now grown to a core staff team of over 10 people. So we have uh, quite a lot of staff designers and engineers and folks who are working to help support the broader MIT community on these payloads and the space projects that we work on. And then we still have our 50, it's now actually closer to 60 plus graduate students, staff and faculty, the community that we serve at MIT. Our ecosystem starts with this first layer, all of the students and the staff and the faculty doing the research with us, but we're also fortunate to be part of a broader network of amazing people that bring interesting insights and input into our creative process. So we work closely with the Media Lab member companies. We collaborate extensively now across MIT with MIT Aero Astro, MIT EAPS, uh, sometimes even Sloan and MIT Lincoln Laboratory, MIT Architecture. And we have been incredibly fortunate over the last few years, often started out of conversations here at Beyond the Cradle to work closely with a crew of astronauts from across NASA, ESA, the European Space Agency and JAXA. And why this is so important is they are the humans who have experienced life in space. They are a source of the best user research that we could ever do and being able to learn from their insights and collaborate them um, on the future projects has been an incredible opportunity and very rewarding for the space initiative. And I just like to call out and say thank you to Katie Coleman who may be on this call, who just did a STEAM outreach session for us as part of Beyond the Cradle. It's a tradition that we always do. We uh, try to connect some astronauts to a local classroom. So thank you, Katie, for already joining us this morning to do that. And then finally, all of these aspects of the ecosystem, they funnel down into supporting over 40 in-house research projects. So when I say that we're designing the artifacts of our sci-fi space future, that means everything from musical instruments to that could you know, uniquely only be played in a microgravity environment, contributing to the future culture of space exploration, to the technical work required for space habitats and sustaining life in space. We'll hear a little bit more about all of these different aspects later today. Our launch pipeline, the ways in which we actually get our research out there, we start with a parabolic flight. So every year I charter an annual plane flight for the zero gravity uh, project. So any 
um, portfolio projects within our own group and broader MIT as well that we support who need to be able to test their experiment in a few uh, moments of microgravity. This is affectionately known as the vomit comet. Uh, if anybody's heard that term before, you may be chuckling, and that's because the plane essentially does a series of parabolic maneuvers, one after another. And at the top of that parabolic arc, uh, you're able to enjoy you know, 15 to 20 seconds of microgravity, but you do that you know, maybe 20 or 30 times in a row. So it's like a roller coaster in the sky. As projects graduate from the zero-g flights, uh, we then have an opportunity to do suborbital launches with Blue Origin with their new Shepard reusable craft. From there, we also then graduate projects up to doing payloads for up to 30 days on the International Space Station. We also have a project that we've supported that's up there on the outside of the station for a little longer, more like a six month mission. And we are returning to the International Space Station later this year in December for our second mission with four different payloads. We did our first ISS mission with five payloads March of 2020, so just over a year ago. And going forward, we now also have our sights set on the moon and are coordinating various opportunities within MIT for thinking about a to the moon to stay mission and what are the best justified technical payloads that need to be able to be part of the technology development roadmap for sustainable lunar settlement. This is just a mosaic showing you a sense of what all these different projects look like. We have projects at the human body scale, like soft robotic uh, space tails for prostheses to be able to help astronauts um, maneuver and, and keep themselves steady in orbit, all the way up to grand scale space architecture and trying to rethink how large mega scale structures like what we see in science fiction could one day be built and maybe even so in our lifetime. This is, a, again, just a sampling of the many different projects within the 40 plus project portfolio. And if you're ever interested, we encourage you to check out our website or to reach out to me or members of the team to learn more about the various research in these areas. And you'll hear about a few of these projects in the lightning talks today. I referenced a moment ago that we're working on major activities associated with the lunar surface now. I just wanted to highlight this work. We have three major endeavors that are going on at MIT this year. One is a class that I'm co-teaching with Professor Jeffrey Hoffman in the MIT Aero Astro Department. So it's an MIT Media Lab and MIT Aero Astro class. There's a public website that we're making available to other folks who would like to follow along. It's to the moon. Dot pub pub dot org. And this is a course on operating in the lunar environment. So we're teaching a cumulative technical stack. What does it take for lunar class launch? So to get a payload from Earth to the moon. What does it take to land? Once you have landed, how do you deal with the incredibly um, corro corrosive or um, sharp, really, is a better term, lunar dust, right? So there's um, not uh, there is less erosion on the surface of the moon than there is, say, in an Earth-based environment. And so lunar dust is a really serious challenge for a lot of the future lunar payloads that we might be developing. And then from there, we think about all the way up to what does it take to sustain human life? Um, how do you survive the lunar night with solar power and other thermal power systems? And at the end of the course, um, as we progress into late April and May this year, we'll also be looking at policy and governance questions about deconflicting future international activity on the surface of the moon. So through this class, we're also supporting a series of payloads a series of technical projects that could fly to the surface of the moon in the next few years. And then as part of this work, we're also developing under Mehak Sarang within the team, who you'll hear from later today for the Moon Dialogue session, a lunar open architecture. This is a database, the first of its kind, that's meant to be dynamically evolving. So we use best in class web tools to keep it up to date. And what this database holds is all known lunar missions, past and present, across and around the world, the technologies, the payloads that are associated with those lunar missions, where they're trying to land on the lunar surface. And our hope is that by making this database open access, that will empower the next generation of actors to think about coordinated collaborative activity on the lunar surface. So that's LOA, that's L-O-A dot M-I-T dot E-D-U if anyone's interested. I'll also just share that we are deeply committed to our STEAM outreach work. So this is working with younger students to try to get them to see themselves in the future of space exploration. And for the last several years, we've been running a climate CubeSat co-building program 
this is an opportunity for young students to be exposed to the full life cycle of a spacecraft mission. So they design their mission, they design a small CubeSat, which is a, um, a small, typically 1U or 3U, that's just a unit of size, a small you know, satellite about this big. They design it, they test a prototype. We give them an opportunity to do that on a high altitude air balloon launch. They learn about how to capture data. And then they also are uh, introduced to climate science and how they might be able to one day gather climate science from their satellite if it was to launch into orbit. And we think that this is really important to be introducing students to ways to feel invested in the future health and well-being of their own planet. And I put some links there on this slide just to introduce you all to these different programs. And if you have any young people in your life, um, this material is, is online and open access. And of course, with COVID and the struggles that we're all facing this year, we have had to pause the in-person outreach program, but we've transitioned much of this to a virtual learning environment and are very excited to be able to offer the in-person program again, possibly this fall. Keep your fingers crossed for us, we'll see. And with that, I'll close this introduction. I'm going to prepare to welcome Dr. Cooper in a moment. And I would just say to all of you, as you stay tuned for Beyond the Cradle this afternoon and hear about the amazing research from around the community and our exciting guest speakers that we brought in from outside MIT, I hope you'll stay in touch with us to help us train the future space generation. We are really at an amazing moment in the space industry. It's becoming so much more accessible to get involved. And we would love for all of you, our audience members at Beyond the Cradle, our broader SEI community to be part of that. And so if you'd like to reach out, here's our website, here's our space handle. Uh, my email is on the website if you'd like to reach out to me directly and we really look forward to hearing from you.